so let's talk a bit about how communication has worked during the crisis. So in terms of how this outbreak compares to other health health emergencies, I mean, yeah. are these challenges unique to the Ebola West Africa outbreak? There were certain, certainly similarities to other diseases. I mean, stigma and fear are there with, with other diseases. One of the things I think was, that was different with this outbreak and for us as an organisation was that <clears throat> at a time when we were incredibly busy and focused on what was happening in West Africa, in, in, the, in the affected countries in West Africa, we were also finding ourselves spending an awful lot of time as communications people dealing with the fear and the fear-driven responses of our own national governments and health authorities. So, um, you know, issues around stigma for returning health workers was something that actually took up a lot more time than it should have done. So we were sort of felt like we were fighting on every front. So we had main focus was very, very much on what was happening in the affected communities in West Africa, but we were also dealing with, you know, crazy headlines from our, our, our own domestic media. It was like as though our governments, you know, collectively, those sort of Western governments went from, you know, la la la, la la la, not really a problem, normal, normal response will do, to, oh my God, we're all going to die. And, um, and that, was, that was really problematic, yeah. So thinking about th that fear, how did your staff on the ground deal with that? We do work really hard to try and reduce people's anxiety in a general community setting. Um, so we try to allay fears. And one of the things that, <clears throat> lots and lots of ways in which we do that, try and give, you know, clear health message, okay, this is dangerous behavior, this is not. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've, I think we've tried every which way. <laughs> we've done radio spots, we've taken part in sort of um, phone-ins, we've done kind of all sorts of, we've, you know, helped write songs, you know. But I think then probably the most, most important thing we do is is we travel back we travel into communities so our medical staff our epidemiologists the experts people who really know their stuff go to affected communities and they don't go dressed as spacemen and they sit with with people who are being affected and explain what's going on but the other thing is when somebody has survived um we we take them home so we take them back into their communities. We show that we're not afraid to, to hug this person, to touch this person. So it serves really two purposes. One is to try and reduce the stigma for that person, because there are lots of really awful stories of people who have survived, who've had a ter terrible time, not just themselves, often lost many of their family members, who have then gone home to be cast out from their community. So that's, that's one side of, of that. But the other is to, is to frankly prove that this isn't a death sentence. The role of anthropologists. Yes. Have, do you work with anthropologists? We do. And, how, and then how do you bring in that knowledge from the community? We do, itself? but we probably don't do as much as we should do. I think that we've, we haven't always understood as well as we or should have done um, the particular peculiarities of each community's beliefs and um, yeah, health health seeking behaviour, for example, and that's I'm sure that when we do a proper look back, that will be one of the things that we think we should have done better. So one final question: yeah. uh, thinking ahead to future emergencies, mm. if you were to pick one or two key points that would help improve how you as an organisation and how the global health community response one i think it, it would be about the availability of treatments so you know sometimes you have a new disease that comes along that really has never been seen before but that wasn't the case with ebola you know ebola's been out there for 40 years but no treatment or vaccine had been developed for it because there's a disease of poor people in Congo, and it doesn't really affect very many. And there's no really you know, no market, no sort of profitable market for pharmaceutical development to really want to invest in. I would like to see much more investment at those those infectious diseases in particular that um, that affect maybe at the moment only the world's poor. I mean, I think, I think, I think we've learned a lot of painful lessons about um, about 
communication with affected communities and about the need to be really proactive and to work more with others, not just to say, not just to maybe to say or maybe even just to assume that, okay, we as, as you know, this kind of organisation that's able to provide clinical care, we'll just take this and others will do something else. I think, you know, Ebola or disease outbreaks like this require a, a much more joined up response. And I think maybe, maybe we were at some stages too narrowly focused. Yeah.